afternoon, everyone. My name is Lydia Johnson, and I am the program manager of Ellis Intap. Um, today, we are talking about developing self-help websites. And so I've invited uh, Susan from Ohio Legal Help and also Kate from Indiana Legal Help. And we're going to hear more about their um, websites and what it took to get those launched, um, how they're funded and things of that nature. Um, this is recorded and I will put it up on Allison Tap. Um, probably by tomorrow um, so that you, it can be shared and we can, um, you know, spread this knowledge among the community. And that's basically all I have to say. Um, and we didn't talk about this, but who wants to go first? Okay, I'm going to pick Kate to go first. Okay, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Guerrero, and I'm the director of Indiana Legal Help here in Indiana. And I'm going to share my screen, I think. Yep. Okay, good. And I thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to share today with Deirdre and um, everyone for your time and attention. As I give you kind of a short overview of Indiana Legal Help and um, what we are. So indianalegalhelp.org uh, is our website and we are a program of the Indiana Bar Foundation. We're really the website for Indiana's Coalition for Court Access, which is our Access to Justice Commission. Um, the goal of our website is pretty simple um, at, you know, at its base. We try to connect people to our legal assistance organization and organizations and partners around the state. And then we also try to provide a pretty substantial library of self-help forms and other information for folks who either can't um, secure civil legal assistance or who do secure civil legal assistance. And we're seeing a growing need for this. Um, but need some sort of forms or support before they go to meet with an attorney or the attorney often sends them to the website to get some information. So um, it's been great to see uh, um, some partnership there. So we launched in the fall of 2018. And when we launched, we were pretty bare bones. We started with maybe 15-ish self-help form packets that I um had vetted through our coalition for court access. So we took them off the Indiana Supreme Court's website and put them on to this new indianalegalhelp.org after vetting and reviewing them. And we put them in fillable format only. Um, since then, we're up to probably 50 self-help court form packets and a lot of uh, other information. Um, we I wanted to kind of go over how we built the website, I think, first and what we're considering doing next. So we, the um, website is built in WordPress, which you all probably know is just sort of an off-the-shelf product. It's super builder-friendly and allows us to do no-code updates. It's based on themes and prepackaged templates like so many other website builders. So we have a theme that we can choose from or that we use and we can choose from different templates within the theme. It's really easy to add pages and build content. If we do need a developer, WordPress is really easy to find um, someone who's well-versed as a developer in that area. Um, out of the box, it's a little clunky, but you can improve functionality using plugins, just little pieces of code that we kind of stick on the back end that allow the website to do some fancier things. There are some drawbacks to it. And again, like this is a pretty basic website. It's not very secure, which we are, have concerns about um, because WordPress is so common. If someone wants to find a weakness in a WordPress site, they're finding a weakness in a whole lot of websites. So we know that's an issue. Um, we do have to keep it updated really regularly because of um, those security issues and because we have plugins that are um, from different builders working in the background. Um, another drawback that we see is plugins um, don't stay functional forever. People develop these and then they die. So if that's what we're relying on, it goes away. We have a pretty big issue there. Um, navigation and other features can be pretty limited. 
and not as dynamic or intuitive as what we'd like to see. But I will say the upshot of this is it's relatively inexpensive um, and you can do a lot of the work yourself. Um, so that's where we started. Where we're going right now is considering a custom build of a website to address all those issues I just talked about, um, particularly functionality and security. So we have a wish list that we want to make sure the website can do, and it, you just can't do it in a basic WordPress site the way it is now. Um, with a lot of custom code built into um, a basic WordPress, we get more security, although we typically would still see some plugins running on the back end. Requires less frequent updates. Of course, the downside is we have to have a custom developer to build and increase costs. So that's sort of where we started and where we're going. Um, because it's website 1.0, I started thinking about things I wish I would have known five years ago or even like three years ago. What do I think about a lot when I look at a website? Um, analytics. Um, we use primarily Google Analytics running on the back end to collect a lot of data. And, um, we want to know where the website is accessed from, what information folks are looking for. We get a lot of direction just by looking at where, what pages they're going to and what they're clicking on, how long they stay on the website, and how customers find us. So we can pull all that from Google Analytics. You may likely already know that, but um, we like to see how people are finding us. And the other thing that I'm continually trying to learn about is search engine optimization, so SEO. Um, and again, you likely know this, but um, a couple of years ago, I didn't. So SEO is just different techniques that you can use to help a website rank higher when someone does a Google search. Um, we have, we hired a marketing company to dive into how people are finding us to help inform how we can improve our SEO. It was not free, but it was relatively inexpensive to get an idea of what people are searching for when they find us. Um, and I will say the number one thing they found that improved our SEO was that we're linked to from so many different trusted partners. So when we took the self-help forms off the, our Supreme Court's website and put it on Indiana Legal Help, they started linking directly to us. And so that was how we ended up with 200,000 visitors our first year. We couldn't have done that without that sort of link. Um, we use Yoast, which is a plugin on the back end of WordPress, and that's pretty widely used to help with SEO. And then we are in the middle of doing some like content tags and schema in the back end of WordPress. Um, if you think of like when someone does a Google search, like if they're looking for, you know, Indiana divorce forms, um, then their little crawlers are going out looking for Indiana divorce forms. And the more content tags and the better schema you have worked up, that's like your website is raising multiple hands to say Indiana divorce forms over here is kind of how I think of it. So we're working on that. And certainly with the rebuild is something that we'll have um, front and center. What do we have on the website? Um, again, we have we try to connect people to low and no cost legal help in their area. So this is our homepage. Um, and so probably the most custom thing we have is this um, interactive map, which is a little clunky. So that's something we would be looking to update, but a person can click on their zip code or their county and find the, our partner organizations in those areas. And then the only other thing I really wanted to dive into on that is um, forms and information. So by far the most widely clicked on area of the website um, are, is forms and information. And we have, like I said, 50 some packets of self-help forms, but I quickly kind of wanted to show you what we do have there. Um, so all of our forms are fillable. So that's not a new thing. Um, but we also, like, this is a little cartoon video we made in, um, with a product called Powtoons and relatively inexpensive. And we created this little, um, this little character to, we didn't create it, we grabbed it from Powtoons to, um, when we uh, first launched our guided interviews to try and help people understand that a guided interview form is the same as your fillable form and you can use more than one tool. So that was a relatively, an expensive website ad. We have screencasts um, that again, um, this we made with the support of the Legal Services Corporation and Indiana Legal Services, which is our um, statewide LSC grantee here in Indiana. 
Um, and these were relatively inexpensive, but grant funded to help explain some sort of complicated areas of the law. So those are up on the website. Um, guided interviews, again, low code way to help folks fill out forms that they might need to file in court. So, so we have quite a bit of information up there, but we try to use different tools and see what works and what doesn't work. And we do pull data from, from those as well. Um, so going back to uh, you know, website 1.0, what would we add or improve if we were going to do this differently? We would build, um, we would improve access for sure. So that's something that's front and center right now. As we look at a website rebuild, um, any multi-language content we could add, we would, um, including a backend or a secondary site in primarily Spanish. Um, just focusing on plain language, making sure that um, we test everything with a screen reader to make sure that it's accessible. Um, we would add a locked portal for our partners and volunteers. We find that a lot of times we want to communicate, you know, CLE information or we want to share like our the master spreadsheet of where clinics are around the state. And it's not that we, it can't be public facing, it doesn't have to be super secure, but it's something that we would want our partners to see before we kind of publicize. So we, we would want a locked end of the website, um, an update, an improved, um, or we don't have one. So a, a clinic calendar that's more dynamic than our plugins can do. Um, a dynamic match to partner organizations based on county areas of code that's not quite as clunky as our map. And then some um, updated and intuitive navigation. Um, and then I think I would just leave you with, if I'm again thinking of what I wish I would have known um, as we started building out this website and thinking about where we're going next is just make sure you track content and keep it updated, keep it updated, keep it updated. Um, make mistakes, know like the world doesn't end. Um, and it's good. There's so many tools out there to to try and experiment with. Um, and we get a lot of good feedback on that. Um, say yes to opportunities and listen to partners and colleagues. We have, this is the most supportive community I've ever been a part of, I think. And um, so just if somebody invites you to their cohort, then say yes, <laughs> because you'll learn a ton. Um, accessibility, multi-language, plain language over and over again, just to continue to keep that front and center and make sure you're accessible to all because you really are in some cases the gateway to the court system here. Um, again, embrace search engine optimization and analytics. Um, let that data drive where you're going. And then I would just also say you can do tech. Tech. Um, I think tech is as mysterious maybe to us in the legal world as the legal world is to folks that are outside of the legal world. So we're trying to all do the same things, use tech to make it easier. And, um, and I just think it's, it's, we're in a unique, we have a unique opportunity to do that. So um, I think that is all I have for this afternoon. And um, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Kate. That was really, uh, that was really good, really insightful. Um, so now we'll hear from Susan. Okay, Let's see if I can do this. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to provide, uh, and everyone can hear me, and I have a little video, so I'm going to share the sound from that video. Hopefully, you folks will hear it. Um, but in terms of, so, so Ohio Legal Help, we launched in late 2019, and I always say nothing like doing a launch um, right in the middle of a pandemic essentially, because we launched and then uh, we went into the pandemic in 2020. But um, we, I'm gonna go through kind of a little bit of our history. Uh, I, I'm sure in some ways it's similar to what other states have experienced. Um, um, we are, I'll give a little bit of the technical aspects, but we're, a, um, we're on Drupal 9 now, we're a custom site and we have integrated, um, we have an integrated experience including um, um, complete document assembly in a TurboTax way on our site. So, um, and I always say this to folks, we actually decided to do it all in one build. Not sure if I would recommend that for everyone, but um, <laughs> the tears laughing at me. But anyways, um, you know, typical origin in some fashion, obviously 
um, Ohio, very much aware of the justice gap. It, um, the project itself actually started um, within the Ohio Access to Justice Foundation. I was general counsel for the foundation at that point, And I said, sure, why not? I'll do this as well. And so we incubated it first, um, but when we launched, um, the goal of, in terms of the governance was that it would be an independent nonprofit and now I'm the executive director of that nonprofit. So um, in terms of the oranges, it comes from Supreme Court of Ohio convened task force on access to justice. They recommended um, some really specific technology, including the development of a statewide website. And so um, we responded, we actually put together a steering committee, which is now my advisory committee. So our governance structure is I have a governing board that acts more like a traditional board fundraising, um, you know, engagement, those types of things. And then I have an advisory committee, which really was the steering committee that guided the initial creation. So um, what we do is we guide users quickly. We do it through a curated um, triage from our homepage. Um, but, you know, as folks know, most of us actually start on the content page by um, arriving at our site via Google search. Um, I would say about 88% actually, um, because right now in terms of folks starting at our homepage, it's somewhere between 12 and 13% as a landing page. Um, we inform users of their legal options. We provide integrated tools to help them take the next steps, um, typical plain language legal information. Um, and then obviously the interactive form assembly and kind of a TurboTax um, kind of guided interview. And then um, you get the forms at the end. Um, in terms of our site, we are mobile first. So we actually build for your phone. So we're building, we do wireframes for the smallest screen out there. So we think of the desktop secondary as to the mobile. So we're a mobile first site. Um, and then we also connect users to curated community-based resources um, based upon legal topics, social needs, demographics, and geography. And, and, and that is all part of the integration into our platform. Here's my advisory committee. I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, and there's even more if it's possible. Um, but anyways, we actually meet with them quarterly. They have work plans um, and they work on their work plans. And so they are part of the core group of folks that act as kind of content and user experience governance on the site. So we talk about governance in that fashion. Um, we have the Alliance of Ohio Legal Aids, but we also have the private bar. The judges are big champions of the site. So we have the Judicial Conference along with the Supreme Court all, all as partners on this site. And I'm sure other states are similar to this. We also have the clerks of courts. They're separate. They're also um, parties to the advisory committee. And then in terms of, um, I know this question always comes up, especially when you're a nonprofit and you have to exist, obviously. So sustainability is one of the issues um, that I think about nightly. Um, but you know, in terms of that, we have had some success. Um, here are, in terms of our current funders, they range from community foundations to private foundations to bar foundations to obviously Ohio Access to Justice Foundation is one of our um, major partners. And then in terms of LSC, we've been fortunate to work with one of our legal aid programs here in the state community legal aid, um, and they are our partner with respect to LSC TIG grants. And so uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with community legal aid and LSC to do some um, substantial um, platform enhancements to the site. In terms of the core topic areas, folks will see, you know, family is probably our number one. And this is literally the order of kind of where things are now. Family followed by housing are usually our number one areas of access, um, followed by money and debt. And then, and then it's actually going to court. Um, going to court, that court navigation, we actually did voice a customer. We had a lot of data before we launched. Um, it all got into the build. Um, and when we did a voice of the customer, we um, oversampled low income. We had 800 Ohioans participate in that online study. Um, what we learned was they had said that after barriers, like obviously money, finding a lawyer, those types of things, um, their biggest fear, their area of anxiety was actually understanding how to navigate that court process actually after they leave our site. Um, and so I'm um, going to court after kind of those core areas of family housing, money and debt. Um, it's usually one of our um, number one, I say after kind of access areas. Um, and so, but obviously core areas, public benefits, education, immigration, and then we are launching the um, Spanish language version of the site. Um, it's, it technically exists, but we'll launch it um, later this summer. 
And then in terms of the technical build, Drupal has a way to manage that content, to manage both the English and the Spanish language content. So we did those updates and we also did some custom updates for us to make that management of that content easier and for QA as well. Um, I'm, hopefully this video will work. Ohio Legal Help is a secure, trusted website that helps hundreds of thousands of Ohioans navigate their legal challenges. This video will show you how to use the Ohio Legal Help website, whether that is from your phone or computer. Let's say, for example, you have a family issue. You can click on the family card and answer a few questions to help us direct you to the right information for you. Once you are on the page, read through Understanding the Basics for Step-by-Step -step Legal Information and what action you can take. Next, look at Forms and Letters to see what forms might help with your legal issue. You can create an account through the My OLH User Hub, which allows you to find, save, and complete court forms on your own schedule. Lastly, if you have more questions or think you need to speak with a lawyer or other community advocate, go to Legal Help and Lawyers or Local Government and Community Resources for more help. Get started with resolving your legal issue today at www.ohiolegalhelp.org. Ohio Legal Help is a secure. Close that. Okay. So that's um, that is the quickest demonstration I can do. Uh, I know we had limited time, um, so and that gives folks uh, kind of a generalized feel for the way um, the user experience on the site is. I always say big finger friendly buttons and cards because we're mobile first, and so. Um, and that's why you saw the size of the buttons in that fashion, the cards display in that fashion. We work on, I would say, a hub and spoke model. In other words, um, those triage questions, and to be fair, the way that we do SEO, we do SEO so that folks end up on those topic pages, if you will, um, because those topic pages have the geo-curated links based upon legal area. So for instance, we probably have nearly 2,000 curated resources on the site based upon legal area and geo-specific areas as well. So for instance, if you're thinking about divorce with kids and you told me you live in Franklin County, Columbus, Ohio, you're gonna get the resources for that. And then, and we grab that information. And so that's integrated into our system. And then we have the management on the back end in terms of how we do that. And the way that our forms work, it's all on the site. So it's all integrated into the site. And so we have a process by which we do all of that, including the very tedious task of making every PDF form in the state accessible. Um, and so, and that takes real time. And so that's part of kind of our workflow in terms of what we do. Um, so again, we launched in September of 2019, currently more or less. I mean, that's the visits that Google grabs, it's about 80,000 visits a month. We know from our other analytics, we probably have more than 100,000 um, visitors on the site, but people ask, they actually mask um, and then today, since we launched in September of 2019, we've had more than 1.3 million users from all 88 Ohio counties, including counties that probably have less than 10,000 people, um, and more than 4 million page views. About 80, a little bit over 80% of our folks are from the state of Ohio. Um, and then, you know, we have folks from all over, but the majority of our folks are from Ohio. And we do that a lot through, a lot through in the way that we do SEO and data on the page in terms of, because we really want Ohio folks. Um, and then this year, we're probably gonna have, actually, that's probably this year's number. Uh, we'll probably have nearly 700,000 users, um, it's an older PowerPoint, um, and probably next year, we'll be closer to, probably if we're, we're experiencing about 20% growth um, since COVID numbers, I guess, really accelerated everything. Um, and so I, I, I suspect we'll probably be at like, 900,000 in our next year of operation or so. Um, and we also haven't launched Spanish language and because I will tell you, content is not easy to manage. We've not 
we have been, we've not brought on content just to bring on content. How about that? And what really brings folks to your site is Google loves content. And so but we've been more judicious about that because we have to manage it and maintain it. So content maintenance is always a challenge. Um, quick facts, we're developed as Project Ohio Access to Justice Foundation. We're a statewide nonprofit. We actually established in 2018, but I would say we, we opened our virtual doors in September of 2019. We have five employees. I have a product manager, a content manager. Um, I have a data and form specialist. Um, I have a comms manager, and then I, and I am one of those employees. So I, that is the five. We also have two contract content writers that work with us. And then I work with a development firm um, that we've had actually since the beginning. Um, I have a 10 member governing really fundraising board and then one statewide advisory committee. There's two subcommittees, um, one which focuses on user experience and the other focuses on finding unmet needs in their communities. Um, and again, they have work plans as does my board. Um, I run eight meetings a year, four board meetings and four advisory committee meetings. And then they have one joint meeting as well. Um, and then that's it. Um, I, you know, I think you really want a discussion literature, right? So um, I'm gonna, at this point, um, let you open it up for discussion and I'm gonna stop the share. Yeah, if anybody has any initial questions, feel free to chime in. If not, I've kind of prepared some questions to kind of get the ball rolling. All right, so we'll start with my questions. And I actually jotted down a couple more questions after hearing you guys talk. Um, so first I wanna just kinda, oh, David Gray has something. You both you can share. If you can share, uh, David asks for you both, if you can share, what is your annual, annual budget, including everything from salaries to maintenance? Um, my budget next year is, around 850, 900,000 with salaries making up the bulk of that, but um, maintenance on the site, and I have a subdomain because we run, or we're gonna launch a virtual self-help center with a court um, in any day now. Um, anyways, um, and so I'll, I'll be hosting some subdomains. Our maintenance just on that alone, um, along with our course site, um, even with the symmetrical code base, it's probably going to run um, 75,000, potentially a little under 100,000, just on maintenance alone of the site. It's a lot of security. We do a lot of security. Um, so um, our site is way more basic and you can see, so um, on our end, it's me. And as of less than 60 days ago, it's one other staff person. So over the last year, we've run on um, probably about $150,000 per year, including website design, maintenance, and all the tools that we've created. Um, we're primarily through grant funding, um, and then we do receive ref um, some dollars from the court as well. Thank you both for sharing. Does anybody have any other questions? <laughs> um, so I like to start off on a high note, right? Because these projects, um, you know, it's not just a website. It's not that it's basic, like it's still a lot of work, no matter if you're just starting out or you've been around for years, right? And so I'd like to ask each of you, like, what are you most proud about on your launch? Like, what made you be like, listen, this is, I love this. It's gonna sound awful, but I was just so happy we launched. Um, yeah. I, I think the fact that it got done um, because it, it actually had been, um, and you know, there had been a statewide website um, and it, was, it wasn't maintained. Um, and so um, it kind of became obsolete. And so, um, and then there had been a number of false starts to try to do it and it just didn't get done. Um, and so um, after the Supreme Court's recommendation, you know, the steering committee came together, they all agreed and, you know, brought in all those divergent voices. And we all agreed based upon, we did a really long data landscaping of this is what we're gonna do. They all agreed. And then um, we launched, we did a friends and family launch. We had, I think 
1,500 folks in the system, including court staff, everyone that participated in our friends and family try to break it launch. Um, and then we launched. Um, and so um, for me, that day when we hit and went live, I was just so happy. Yeah. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, I think I think on my end, I would just say what we're most proud of, I think, as an organization is the shift in culture that we've seen since the website launched. We launched, like I said, it, I mean, it's pretty bare bones now, but it was pretty basic. And we did, um, folks weren't always super welcoming to the idea of having the self-help forms online or the idea that um, we would be adding document. There was just a um, there was a lot of navigation around that. And I will say that I've, if people have those same feelings or not sharing them with the gusto that they used to. So I think we have turned the tide a little bit. And um, like Susan mentioned, a lot of it is just making sure that the content is good and making sure that it's usable for people. And so I think once people saw that, okay, well, this is actually helping the court move a little bit faster and a little bit easier and saving everybody else time we kind of saw that tide turn a little bit. So I'd say I'm pretty proud to have played some part in that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and kind of shifting over to content a little bit, you guys both kind of talked about, you know, your content areas and what you have on your website. I want to talk a little bit more about um, how are you tracking the content? I, I, it's a twofold question. First, how did you determine the, the initial content? And then how are you kind of keeping track and maintaining that content? So um, we actually did a voice of customer oversampled low income and they told us um, and number one, family law, everyone wanted family law. Um, we then also surveyed 1200 stakeholders in the system, including hundreds of judges, magistrates, attorneys, you know, um, community agencies. Um, they also said family law. So there was a nice convergence uh, followed by housing evictions. And so we had that data. And then we also looked at, I got the, all the Supreme Court case management data. And so we looked at that as well. Um, and from there, there was a really just nice convergence, um, family law. And, and then we obviously look at our J on our site. Um, we have a lot of specialized metrics. We have some custom metrics through either hard coding it on the data layer, or we use um, GTM to tag data. Um, but like our forms, for instance, um, we look at success a little differently. So we did our domestic violence forms with the advisory committee on domestic violence and they wanted a red flags triage. So I can look at our forms data to the question at which someone abandons. And what we've learned is about 50% of folks stop at that red flags triage, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, and then um, folks go on because usually what happens in that red flags triage is we can connect them to a curated resource in their local area to connect with an advocate. It's super cool that you had access to all of that data. Um, Is it? I'm not sure. No, just, it's, no. it was probably a blessing and a curse, honestly. It is, but it is it's, both. Yeah. 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 It's both. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. They will deliver it to you. Yeah. Kate. <laughs> Um, that's great. Yeah. So we, we were way more organic with our, so we, when we launched our website, we, our first charge was to take the, um, forms and content that were already available on the Supreme Court's website and put it on our page. So we knew exactly what was coming over. And then from there, um, that content is, um, was reviewed and approved by our, one of the working groups in our coalition for court access. So we knew that content was going on. And then we used the website to kind of figure out what other people were looking for. And we listened to our network providers. So the Bar Foundation is also um, like the IOLTA funder in our state. So we have legal assistance organizations that we partner with really closely on, on lots of different things. So we listen to them. What are they looking for when people come in to their offices? What are they asking for? What kind of content would be helpful? And then they were really quick to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down as we added content. Um, and they keep asking for more. So, um, and then we also, um, I answer the emails through the website. So we get a lot of um, requests for information through there and we can kind of figure out, um, you know, if one person's asking for it, we kind of can see a pattern and decide whether or not to add that content. Those questions all go through our coalition um, and then we create the forms and move on from there. And then how do we 
track it and keep it updated. That's an ongoing challenge we're experiencing with different things. The first thing that we did was give every form a form number that, um, and in the form number, there's the date of the last review. So that feels like the most obvious way to track it. So at least we know when it was last updated. And then there's a series of um, spreadsheets and review processes on the back end that's um, pretty basic, but also time consuming. Um, that we do. And then um, the other added layer that we have too, is we add, like, as we add guided interviews, we have to remember that there's forms on the back end of that and make sure that they're the same as the forms that we're offering in PDF. So um, I would just say tracking content is a challenge. Um, but we also, we're in the middle of building out a Salesforce app that will help us, um, that will help us kind of tag and calendar that content as well. So there's tools we, that you can use to do it. Yeah, most definitely. I think what I love that both of you kind of talked about is incorporating that user. I've done many presentations on, you know, user testing, and I really believe in getting users involved in from the beginning, right? A lot of people feel like user testing should come when you already have something. And it's like, no, 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 you can get them involved from the beginning. So I'm really glad that both of you guys kind of touched on that. Um, we have another question from David. He said, how um, are you working with your state's legal aids or other orgs in order to not duplicate efforts and or collaborate on content creation, document assembly, et cetera? So in terms of duplication, I, I think there, um, I think, you know, I, th I think there are kind of competing interests there because sometimes funders want um, content. And so I think some of our partners will you know, duplicate content. So I don't want to talk too much on, on that because that's kind of driven by different competing interests. But in terms of how we collaborate with folks, um, so our content process um, is, I'm the only attorney on staff. And so our content is actually created by um, folks who are more experts in plain language. And so um, all my content writers are actually non-attorneys. Um, um, but they have experience, uh, like one of our content writers was PIO for the governor and has a comms experience. And so she knows about talking to people. She was also my um, director of consumer education when I was at the general's office. And so we work kind of um, in that model and we bring on a legal expert for every piece of content that we do. And we bring on someone from the private bar. We bring on somebody from legal aid. That's an expert in that area as well. And then we bring on the court as well. And so all three get to comment because all three are, um, um, you know, and users of the information, and then we user test, and so that's kind of our collaborative process. We bring in partners that way, um, and then obviously they tell us about needs that they're seeing um, that are going unmet in the community, um, and then we obviously incorporate that information as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, so similar and different. So how do we not duplicate um, what our legal partners are doing around the state? Um, I will say we don't always do that well, um, but we're in two different space, not two different spaces, but we play different roles. So Indiana Legal Help really does try to be a landing pad of information for all of our legal assistance organizations around the state. Some are LSC funded, some aren't. So a lot of times we'll put up a form that maybe a different organization has available, but another one doesn't. And what we do find in those instances too is not only are both legal assistance organizations willing to um, give us pointers and ideas about what to put into the form, they're actually often glad that we put it up so they don't have to maintain it. So um, there's not typically a lot of competition in there. And then as far as like, I'm collaborating on content creation and document assembly, same things. I will say that um, we have really great partners that I know have said before, well, we were going to put this up on our website, but now that we have you there, we're just going to link over to you because they would rather be providing legal services than maintaining their website. So it's a partnership that way. And um, I will say, I think I maybe I think we might just be lucky here, but I've never had a legal assistance organization say no if I ask them to participate or review something or help me out with something and vice versa. And so like the other day, um, a, one of our partners was creating a guided interview for internal work. Um, and we've created 
guided interviews externally. So we had a great meeting about tips as you're building guided interviews and we just share information that way. They're also helping us do some user testing on a different guided interview that we created. So it's really just sort of this like open door policy. We're all in this together and um, sort of just dropping the rope over possession. It's just like, what, how can we make this work most efficiently? And most people are um, willing to kind of just figure that out as we go. So we, it hasn't been a big issue to be competitive in that way. Great. I'm glad that you guys have had those experiences and people are, you know, willing to, uh, to kind of pitch in and, and collaborate. Um, my next question is about forms. So the forms you guys have looked very different, right? Um, and so, you know, Susan, you've got yours. Yours is great in your website. You don't, users don't have to go anywhere. Kate, you've got kind of like this dual thing going on where you have fillable PDFs, but also guided interviews. So if you guys could just talk a little bit more about your forms. Susan, I'd love to know more about, um, you know, what kind of tech you guys are using for those forms and such. Um, but yeah, if you could just give us a little more information about your forms in your forms process, I'd love to hear. So we, so our base module on our form builds is uh, we wanted a low code, no code solution, although, you know, we're, we're pretty much in the YAML at this point, but take that, you know, like when we started, we wanted a low code, no code solution. So we use um, the Drupal 9 um, and we, we built originally on I can't remember anymore. But anyways, Drupal, a version of Drupal. How about that? But we're on Probably nine. Now. Seven. Yeah, but we're on nine now. Yeah. Um, but anyways, um, we use the web form module, but let's just say we we use it in a way because we actually had to connect with the web form module developer. Um, and because we're doing some additional proprietary enhancements to it. Um, so we're using it in a unique way. Um, but we use that as our basic web form module because um, we can build mobile first, use, utilizing that. Um, it would then we use an integration. Um, so after someone's completed with the form, they can download the form or they can email the form to themselves. Um, our form integration, our third-party integrations is actually with um, a company called Formstack. Um, and so that's where um, the, in a sense, the, the web form submission data sits on our Drupal site so that we keep, we maintain that data, but it goes to Formstack and then essentially it integrates and it creates the PDF, if you will. So submission data, and then that's basically a JSON file. So we have to do the mapping. Um, and then in terms of the, um, since we do have an email integration, um, those emails are, we use SendGrid to do those emails. And then we have um, a complete like, if you register for the site, um, we use um, we use Locker so that when someone registers, so there's some MFA when you first register, um, and then we also do have to do captures and other things as well from a security perspective. But essentially, every time someone comes to the site and logs back in, they get a unique key from Locker. It unencrypts their data just for that session, and then they basically after they leave. If they come back, they get another key. So every time, and we keep all the data encrypted both um, obviously during the session and at rest. We made the intentional decision not to keep any PII in terms of the way our state consumer statutes define PII, but that's very different than what I consider personal information for the purpose of security. So, um, and then we have essentially a security policy and a sentry that's on the site that also helps monitor data, prevents bots, a lot of different incursions that's been constantly monitored. So if you're going to do that data capture, maintaining everything on the site, um, you really do have to have security that you're constantly monitoring. So I, I will say, um, you know, because we had a full security audit done, we had brute force attacks done against the site. We to test it, um, and anyway, I, I'm not going to release like what we. But you know what I mean. Like it's important that if you're going to do forms properly with that data capture, you need to think about that. We also got some great pro bono skills based assistance advice from LexisNexis. LexisNexis serves on the board, and their parent company Relics helped us um, and helped us with our privacy policy as well. So I say go and get some skill-based volunteers. They're fabulous.
Um, yeah, and we obviously built really differently because we are not, um, we don't house our forms on the site. And really for a lot of the reasons that Su Susan pointed out, we don't have that type of data security. That's what I was sharing at the beginning because we're out of the box without a custom build. We don't want to be collecting that kind of data. So we've built our guided interviews with a low code tool. Um, they're now called net documents before they were called after pattern before that called community lawyer. So um, we built and they host on their ADS, AWS servers outside of um, outside of where we're hosted. And then we do put just a security warning on the website. Um, and we collect data on the back end through that app. Um, we chose to go that way primarily, well, there were two reasons, well, really three, so cost, <laughs> um, and then we didn't want to host on the website um, for security reasons, and then we wanted something that was low or no code, so we put those guided interviews on top of our fillable forms. They do have to um, be separate. We initially, when we started building guided interviews, um, intended to pull our fillable forms down because at the end of the guided interview, they're emailed to them or they can be printed. And um, we got a lot of feedback from our legal assistance organization saying, please don't take the PDF fillable forms down because we want to be able to print them and hand them to people who do not, who are really um, falling um, out like inside that or outside that digital divide. So we left them that way. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just stop there. That's why we are building the way we are. Um, and we'll see going forward with our new site. I think we intend to continue to build in our apps, um, but we're experimenting with a couple of other things too. Yeah, we kept our download downloadable, fillable blank PDFs on the site as well. They're just all like, you can either start the form or you can download the, it's all within kind of the same experience. Yep. I've been really envious of that experience for a really long time. So I've been watching the Ohio and, and trying to figure out how, you know, how does this work and how can we, um, but yeah, we just haven't had the, the funding or the security measures to be able to do it, but it's, it's great. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. I'm really glad that you kind of highlighted, um, you know, the security aspect of collecting that information because it is important. And I think that, Kate, you know, while you guys uh, have went a different route, I think that, you know, you you picked the right thing, right? You knew you didn't have either, you know, the money, the capacity to, um, you know, do what needs to be done security. And so you found another way to, to make sure that your users, um, you know, data was secure. And that's that's the goal, right? Um, so I'm really glad you both highlighted that as Ellison Tap last year, our annual series was on security so we always want to highlight um, the security implications with all of the tools that were that were um, developing and, and, and pushing out to, to the general public right um, so we have about 10 minutes left so if anybody has any uh, questions feel free to put them here if not I'm going to ask them my last question which is what was your biggest challenge in creating your site It's actually content. It wasn't the technology. I, I, you know, I say this, um, that the technology is merely a tool. We build out additional tools so that my content team can have more, you know, whistles and bells, but building, deciding what content first, right? Um, we got data to guide that, but then building out the content, plain language, um, and then maintaining that content is probably, I would say, the biggest challenge in terms of like our day-to-day. -day. And we have lots of tools. We did a content audit. We have lots of things on the site that help us, but it's still very much staff specific. And you, it's something that if you're going to do this, I always tell folks, okay, great, you're going to build it. And to be fair, I think good sites can be very basic on the technology as long as the information is good because there's lots of different um, form integrations that's possible. But that content maintenance, as, as other states have asked me, I said, how are you gonna maintain that content? I mean, that is the biggest um, kind of what keeps you up at night kind of thing. Like, how are we gonna maintain that content? And then on top of that, we're curating all those resources. Totally makes sense. 
Yeah, I'll just 100% agree. How do you keep it updated? You know, every six months we have session and the statutes become updated and sometimes they're super friendly to self-represented litigants. You want to get that information out really quickly. Sometimes they are changing verbiage within, you know, a divorce petition that to a self-represented litigant is probably not going to matter, but you don't want to give a judge some sort of license to reject the form because you're not following a piece of statute. So it's just content update and making sure um, not only that your content is good, but that you're linking to good content that's also staying updated. So we have some pretty close parameters around what what other resources we'll share on the site, mostly limited to GOV sites. Maybe just a few, like few exceptions to that, but yeah, it's just, it's content and making sure it's relevant and usable and you're not sending folks down the wrong path. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, at my time at Michigan Legal Hope, I spent lots of time updating things, right? I mean, you would spend days uh, just doing QAs uh, and, and it's gotta be done. It's more of the tedious work, right? Uh, because you're just reading things, checking links, you know? Um, so so it can be it can be a lot, especially as you continue to grow your library, right? And when your staff stays the same, right? That only means one thing, people have more and more things to review. Um, so I can definitely see how that would be challenging. Um, and I, I, but I have faith that you guys are working that out um, and, and making sure that that's staying, um, staying up to date. Um, those are all the questions that I had. Um, you guys have been great sharing so much good information, um, you know, that we just, we don't get to know. It's like, we, we, we hear it when it's all done, right? The, we launched um, and, and just being able to learn how both of your um, sites came to be. Um, it's just really insightful. And I think super helpful um, because even, you know, people, even if you do have a site, I think there's still things to learn, um, you know, from one another and how we do things. And, uh, you know, a website is just, it's constantly evolving, right? Like that is the state of the internet. Um, constantly just different, you know, these iterations and sometimes daily depending on what's going on, right? And so I think we all have something um, to learn. So thank you to both Kate and Susan for coming and sharing information with 